On this mannequin, again, we can see the larynx up here and the thyroid gland is over the top of the trachea. This is the thyroid gland. We can see the major vessels in the neck, the carotid artery taking blood up to the brain and the jugular vein bringing blood back down. Here we can see the left clavicle, and the right clavicle and the first rib there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, connected to the sternum via the costal cartilages. On this model, we don't see any intercostal muscles. We see straight through to the lung fields beneath. And if we take these lungs off, Well, here we can see the underside with the lung and we can see the domed nature of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm domes up and then flattens. And when the diaphragm contracts, it actually moves down and flattens. When it's up like this, that means it's in a relaxed state. And we can see that the diaphragm domes up quite a long way because that's the base of the sternum here. And we notice that because the sternum is a flat bone, the red bone marrow is inside. The bone marrow is red. It is bone marrow that produces blood cells, particularly red blood cells are produced in the red bone marrow inside flat bones such as the sternum. Here we see the heart and these large blood vessels. This is the aorta taking oxygenated blood to the body. This is the superior vena cava bringing deoxygenated blood back from the body. And here we see the pulmonary artery taking blood to the lungs. The main trunk of the pulmonary artery goes back, then it quickly divides into two, one branch going to each lung. And if we look in the lung fields in here, we can see that the pulmonary artery vessels are in blue because they're taking deoxygenated blood into the lung to be oxygenated. This blood will then go through the pulmonary capillaries, which are in close association with the alveoli. When the blood is oxygenated, it will drain back in the red vessels, which are branches of the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins in the lungs are in red because they're bringing back the oxygenated blood. Because remember, a vein is defined as any structure carrying blood towards the heart, whereas an artery is any structure carrying blood away from the heart. And here we also see some of the bronchial passages taking air to all parts of the lung. Taking air into the lung and allowing air to go out of the lung as well. And here we see cross sections of the ribs. The first rib, second, third and fourth. And if we look at these closely, we see that again, the bone marrow in the ribs is also red bone marrow, producing blood cells. And between the ribs we can see the intercostal muscles here, 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 here. So the ribs and the intercostal muscle are comprising the chest wall. And actually if I turn this mannequin to the side and we can look in here, 
what we see there is the parietal pleural membrane. The parietal pleural membrane is lining the inside of the thoracic cavity. The visceral pleural membrane would be lining the surface of the lung. In health, we notice that there's no gap between the surface of the lung, which would have the visceral pleural membrane attached to it, and the inside of the thoracic cavity with the parietal pleural membrane attached to it. That's because the visceral pleural membrane is completely sucked up to the parietal pleural membrane. There is only a potential space between the visceral and parietal membranes in health. And if we look at this lung, this lung is arranged in cross-section. Let's see if we can get some light on that. And what we see here are cross-sections of blue vessels. And the blue vessels are going to be arterial vessels taking blood to the lungs to be oxygenated. And here we see cross-sections of red vessels. And the red vessels are going to be cross-sections of pulmonary veins taking blood back to the heart after it has been oxygenated. And also in various parts of the lung, we see cross-sections of the bronchial passages, still supported by rings of cartilage to keep them patent, taking air in and out of the lungs, from the large airways such as the trachea, down all the way to the bronchioles and the alveoli. And here again we see the domed nature of the diaphragm, this dome of muscle. When it contracts, it flattens to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. At the same time, the intercostal muscles contract to move the chest wall up and out. Both of those effects will increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. As you increase the volume, you reduce the pressure, meaning the air is sucked in to the lungs. Humans are negative pressure ventilators, dependent on the action of the diaphragm and the ribs and intercostal muscles. The diaphragm is actually innervated by phrenic nerves, the two phrenic nerves, which leave all the way up at the cervical vertebrae in cervical nerve roots three, four and five, coming down through the chest to the diaphragm. You can remember that because C3, 4 and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. Whereas its spinal nerves supply the intercostal muscles with neurological innovation. So a very interesting model of the thoracic cavity. Here we can actually see the rings of cartilage on the trachea just before the trachea bifurcates into the left and the right main bronchus. And we can see this major airway in this model here. Here we see the trachea, left main bronchus, right main bronchus, we see that the left main bronchus divides into two lobar bronchi, superior lobe and inferior lobe. We can see that the right main bronchus divides into three, one, two, three lobar bronchi going to the left, superior, lower and middle lobes. We see the rings of cartilage keeping the airways open. 
we see further bronchial passages comprising the bronchial tree going to the pulmonary segments. And of course, these further subdivide, taking air to all parts of the lung. And you can see why this is called a bronchial tree, because if we turn it upside down, it looks just like a tree. At the top, here we see the thyroid cartilage, which is part of the larynx. And here we see the first ring of cartilage, which is called the cricoid cartilage. And this first ring of cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, is the only cartilage in the trachea, which is a complete ring of cartilage. The others are C-shaped rings to allow distortion as a result of food boluses going down the esophagus. But the cricoid cartilage is a complete ring. And between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage is the cricothyroid ligament. That ligament there is the cricothyroid ligament. And you can feel that in your own neck if you palpate the little gap between that bit and that bit. And then occasionally, if the airway is blocked in an emergency medical situation, there's a procedure called a cricothyroidotomy, where a small airway can be put through there into the trachea to allow breathing to take place. Here we see part of the thyroid gland, which is only shown in its right lobe in this model. And we can actually open this to look inside. Again, there we see the thyroid cartilage from the side and the cricoid cartilage from the side before the C-shaped rings of cartilage that comprise the trachea. And if we take this off, here we're in cross-section. Here we see the vocal cords, and it's these vocal cords that vibrate to generate the voice. So this would actually be the front on this side, and this structure here is the epiglottis, and during swallowing this will fold down to close the glottis, which is the top of the airway, to allow food to go down the posterior esophagus, which would run at the back here. So the upper part of the airway. Of course, it's absolutely vital that these airways are kept patent to allow air into the lungs and out of the lungs.